Good morning, and this is a week nine. So today we will be doing uh, some really exciting stuff. So we'll be moving on to the four fundamental spaces. So the moment you have a matrix, you have four spaces that are defined by the matrix. Even though people usually call them spaces, they're actually subspaces. We will be looking at the fundamental subspaces of a matrix. There are four of them. And then I will tell you how to compute them or what computation subspace even means. And then you will look at the connection between the ranks of matrices and shapes and the spaces. So let's start with uh, our favorite equation AX equal to BB, our favorite matrix that is in of size M rows and N columns. We have the column picture of uh, matrix equations or linear equations that is kind of like working with the vector space defined by the columns of A. The solution in that in that picture in that way of looking at the system of linear equations with that linear combination of the columns of A that gives you B because AX is a linear combination of the columns of A weighted by the components of X. And if you can find the right components so that you get B, then that would be the solution. So once again, AX is the same as uh, the columns of A, A sub I, N of them because there are N columns, N unknowns, and weighted by the corresponding unknowns. And if you can find the right values for XI so that I get uh, B, then I'm done. That is a solution. If you're working with row picture, each row in AX equal to B stands for an equation and these equations in the coordinate space will form something like lines or planes or some shapes, hyperplanes. And the right solution would be the intersection of all these, the, all these shapes. There are two lines. If there is an intersection, that would be the right solution. There are three planes and then the, the, there is an intersection or three planes cutting each other at a point. That would be the solution. Point or set of points, because if there are two planes, the intersection might be a line. So that's the set of points common to all the equations or all the the shapes with the solution. So that is the whole picture. But this is not the view we will take anymore. We have graduated from that view to the core picture, and that's the picture that we will work with starting today. Actually, starting last week. Now we also looked at uh, spans and linear combinations and subspaces. So let's kind of review span. If you have n vectors, let me call them a, i again, each one has m components, so they belong to R, m. If I take all possible linear combinations of the n vectors, that is called the span. That's the definition of the span. So instead of saying set of all possible linear combinations, I can just kind of a, i, n vectors a, i. And uh, so n, of course, is a number, is a count, so it has to be some positive number, integer. And the span, the official definition, mathematical definition would be the set, that is what the curly brackets indicate, the set of all vectors x such that x is a linear combination of vectors of the type ai and there are n of them, there are n vectors, so there are n numbers that I, I have to use. I'm looking for all possible linear combinations, so I use any number. I keep changing the num numbers. How many ve vectors do I have in the span of n vectors? of the type ai m dimensional vector it's an infinite number because i'm i can take any possible value of si any span will have an infinite number of vectors and suppose i start with just one ai just call it a all the scale versions of that vector will be in the span so it's a line of vectors that's infinite number of vectors again so all spans will have infinite number of vectors now subspace is that a span of a number of vectors is actually a subspace because these are linear combinations so if i take any vector in that span and if I want to scale it by an up, I'll get another vector which also will be in the span. If I take two vectors and add them, that also will be in the span because span contains all possible linear combinations. So a span is actually a subspace and that's the practical definition of a subspace. So let me call that subspace C. Now each vector AI has uh, M components. So the span will be a subspace of Rm. So the space is actually a subspace of Rm. So the containing space is Rm. So I'm just calling it using the symbol C, calligraphic symbol C. Now suppose among the n vectors that I started from, n ai vectors, suppose only r of them are linearly independent. Then that will form a basis for the span because you're looking for the minimal set of vectors that will span the subspace that is the definition of the basis and the linearly independent ones will be the right ones to choose. The subspace will have R linearly independent vectors as the basis and the cardinality of the basis, number of elements in the basis, which is R, that will be the dimension of that space. I'm trying not to say this, 
but as you can see basically I'm thinking of a matrix and its columns AI the matrix of size are M rows and N columns and with a rank R. R can never be greater than M because if you have only M components you cannot have more linearly independent vectors than the components nor can it be more than N because you have only N vectors you cannot have more linearly independent vectors than the total number that you have. So there are only R vectors among the N vectors that are linearly independent. So R as you know is less than or equal to the minimum of M the, the dimensionality of each vector and N the number of those vectors. Now if M is actually is if the number of uh, linearly independent vectors is the same as the number of uh, elements of the vector then subspace is actually not a subset of Rm it's actually all of Rm. I have a matrix A it's got n columns standing side by side each one has m components because its matrix is of size m rows and n columns and the column space is defined the column space of A is a set of linear combinations of the columns of A all possible linear combinations. The set of all possible linear combinations is a span of the columns of A. And that is the column space. It has to be a subset Rm because each column vector has m components. So it can be a proper subset or it can be all of Rm. Now how do you specify it? Suppose I ask you to compute the column space. There are three entities I'm looking for. I'm looking for the continuous space. So you have to say the column space is a subset Rm or is equal to Rm and I want to know the dimension which will be the rank of the matrix and then you have to give me the basis vectors. How many of them will you have? Same as R, the linearly independent vectors that will define the space, that will span the space. Remember, if you have n vectors, those vectors will span a space but you don't need all n in most cases, you need only the linearly independent ones. Just because you have more doesn't mean that you cannot create a span. For instance, suppose I have a vector 1, 0 and if I take all possible linear combinations or the span of this vector, that will be all of x-axis or infinite number of vectors along the x-axis. Now suppose I have a few more vectors 1, 0, 5, 0, 2, 0, etc. in a matrix. Its column space is a span of all those columns but it is the same as the span of just one. Well, first of all, it's a span of uh, the three vectors. Let me call them a1, a2 and a3 but it's the same as the span of uh, a1 because other vectors are just scalar multiples in this case of the first vector. So there's no harm in specifying more vectors that you need when you say you want to span but there's no value in it either. If I'm looking for the basis then you cannot specify all three vectors as in the example I just showed you. You have to specify only one. Any one of them will do but the first one is probably the best one referring to the example that I just showed you. Now how many linearly independent vectors are there in A? that would be the rank of A because that is a definition. The linearly independent columns of uh, A would be the column rank which is the same as the row rank so it is the rank of A. What's the dimension of each one of these uh, vectors, each one of the column vectors? That would be the number of elements in the, the vector. That would be the number of rows of A so that would be M. What's a good basis? This is a tricky question. What's a good basis? How do you find the good basis? What you would do is to run a uh, Gauss elimination, get its uh, pro echelon form, pro echelon form, so then you will have pivots somewhere and you will take the pivot columns but not in the REF, not in the row echelon form but in the original matrix. That will give you the linearly independent columns. So the pivot columns of the original matrix would be a good basis. So this is all I'm just telling you without really explaining it too much because you will see examples very soon. Now let's look at the significance of uh, the column space. Now starting from the column picture of uh, linear equations, system of linear equations, we know that Ax equal to b, solving Ax equal to b is the same as looking for right linear combination of the columns of A such that you get b. That is the process of solving in the column picture. Okay, so we, we will be basically looking for x size so that we can take the right linear combination to get the right hand side. But we also know that the column space is the span of the columns of A. So it's the collection of all possible linear combinations. B is not in that column space. Obviously you cannot find the linear combination because it's not a possible linear combination. So the solution is possible if and only if B is a member of the column space. So that is the significance of the column space. Now another thing that you might want to keep in mind is that if you do elementary column operations, what are elementary column operations? Those would be like so basically like taking linear combinations of the columns. All those uh, 
linear combinations will still be in the column space because column space contains all possible linear combinations. In other words, elementary column operations do not change the column space of a matrix. And if you remember, Gram Schmidt basically was a set of elementary column operations to get to the orthonormal version of a matrix. So the column space of uh, the original matrix and the column space of the orthonormal version of it are the same. They may be situations, some algorithms where you want a matrix that is orthonormal but with the same column space. But on the other hand, elementary row operations do change the column space because you are actually messing with uh, elements. What will not change in that case will be some other space which we might call the row space because you're taking linear combinations of rows and if you think of all possible linear combinations of the rows of a matrix as a space, that would be the row space. But we will get that in a second. Now, how do you compute the column space? Or what does it even mean to say compute a space? So let's take an example here. So I have a matrix here. It's a three by three matrix. So for, in this case, rank is on actually three. And if you run the Gauss-Jordan elimination, you will get, uh, let's do the Gaussian elimination first before Gauss-Jordan elimination. So how do you do the Gauss Gaussian elimination? You will take the first row, scale it by five, subtract from the second row so that this guy goes away, that becomes zero. And there'll be some number here. And I'll take the first again, scale it by 13 and subtract from the last row, third row. So this becomes zero. And again, some number here. Now, but these two guys are zeros. The ones with the dashes next to them are zeros. Now what would I do? I'll take the, the second row here. I will scale it by the appropriate number and subtract it from the third row, the modified third row, so that this becomes zero. So I can make that also zero. So I'll have a different number here. Now what I will do is I'll take the first row, scale it in such a way that my pivot here becomes one. It's already one, so scaling is by one. But I have some number here in the pivot in the second row. I'll scale it so that that becomes one. It's always possible. And scale the third one so that that becomes one also. So I've got one, one, one and zero below. So I have this guy to be one, nine, where, where 19 used to be. That is one now because I scaled it. Now I'll take that and I'll scale it by the appropriate factor so that whatever number I have here is a scaling factor. Then I'll subtract it from the second row so that that becomes that becomes a zero. So this has become zero. I, in the second row, I have zero, zero, one, zero. I'll take the second row, scale it by two and subtract from the first row. So I'll get uh, zero here. Then I'll take the third row, scale it by three because I have one there at this point. Scale it by three, subtract from here. And then I'll get zero there. So I'll get zero there. What I'm saying is that each row will have a, a pivot because it's a full range. And I can use the pivot to back substitute and get zeros all above. And I can scale the pivot rows such that the pivots become one. So I can always get zeros above and can make the pivots one by scale. That's why a full rank matrix, full rank square matrix will always row reduce to an identity matrix. So it is full rank. What's the column space of uh, A? So remember, I need three entities. I need to know that it is a subspace of uh, some containing space. In this case, it's a subspace of R3, but it's a special subspace. It contains all of R3. So column space is all of R3. And my recipe was that I would take the pivot columns of A as the basis of, for that column space, but it is all of R3. I have a better basis for all of R3. That would be the identity matrix. So I might as well say that the identity matrix is the, is the basis for my column space. So that is what it is. Now let's take a slightly different example. So it's basically similar to A, except that I killed the last column. So I have only the first two columns. Now, let's do the row reduction here. First of all, what's the rank of matrix? The rank is two because there are two columns and they are linearly independent. What's the reduced row echelon form, RREF, of this matrix? It becomes an identity matrix near the top and zero columns in the bottom. Again, because each column in this case has a pivot and I can use the pivot to get rid of the element below and above the pivot. So I'll get, uh, get rid of, by get rid of, I may mean, now uh, make it zero. So I get zero everywhere other than in the pivot positions. And then I can scale the pivots to make, make them one. So that is always possible. It's a full column rank matrix because I have two columns and all columns are linearly independent. What's the column space of this guy? The column space, remember each column is a member of R3. So the column space is a span of those uh, vectors. So it's going to be a subspace of uh, R3. In this case, it's a two-dimensional subspace because there are only two vectors. So these two vectors will form some plane in R3. That is a subspace, that is a column space of this matrix. So the dimension of the column space is two. Now, if you look at these two vectors, they are in some random direction. 
in R3 and the pane is in some orientation with respect to that. I cannot take the columns I cannot take the columns of this matrix and say that that is the basis because if you think about it, the first column is basically the x-axis. It's uh, It points along the x-axis. The second one is along the y-axis because the second element is a uh, 1. But my column space is not the xy plane. It's some other plane oriented with respect to the axis specified by these two vectors, which is why you have to go back to the original matrix to get the basis for the column space. Now let, let's take one more example where I have uh, a wide matrix. I have two rows and they are linearly independent. They are linearly independent and therefore the rank is actually 2, which you can see if you do RREF, if you do Gauss Jordan elimination, you will get two pivots. So you can see that that is a, a rank 2 matrix. What I'm saying is that the pivot columns, pivot columns of not the RREF, but of the original matrix, this guy and this guy, the pivot columns, will be a good basis for uh, my column space. So what's the column space? Vector, it's got two components, so it's R2, each vector is in R2. So linear combinations will be a subset of R2. What kind of subset will it be? Because I have two vectors that are linearly independent and that subset is going to be actually all of R2. The pivot columns of A will be a good basis, but since it's spanning all of R2, you don't have to take the pivot columns. You can say it is the identity matrix that is the, that is the basis. Just to point out to you, I have two columns that are pivot columns, meaning they have pivots in the RREF. The other columns are that correspond to free variables. Now, if you have, that is uh, all full rank matrices, full rank square matrix, full rank tall matrix, full rank wide matrix. Now, if you have rank deficiency, I have a matrix here, A, the first two columns are the same as the, the A matrices that we looked at, but the third column now is a bit different. What's special about the third column here? Yeah, the third column is just sum of one and two. So there are only two linearly independent columns. So what's the rank of this matrix A? Rank is two. If I do RREF, I'll get some matrix like this, one, one and zero. Rank deficiency now, what's the maximum possible rank this matrix could have? It's a three by three matrix. It could in principle have a rank of three, but it has only two. So the rank deficiency is one. What's the column space of this matrix? It is a subspace of R3 because each vector, each column is of uh, three components. And I have to specify the dimension of the, the column space, that is two, which is the same as the rank. So it's going to be a plane of vectors specified by these two highlighted vectors to so some space. And the basis would be the co corresponding cost in the matrix A, not in the RREF because again, this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. That's not the space that we want, that's not the plane that we want as a column space. It's the plane defined by those two vectors are the columns of uh, matrix A, pivot columns of A. Now another one here, it is uh, a rank one matrix now. There's only one column that's linearly independent. The second column is just twice the first column. And if you do the row reduction, you will get only one row because uh, it's got only rank one. Everything else will be zero. Rank deficiency is one. And the column space, again, it is a subspace of uh, R3 because each column of A has three components. The dimension is one because the rank of A is one. So the line of vectors and the line is specified by this first column of A. The second column will fall on the same line and that would be the column space. So the right uh, basis to use would be the pivot column in the matrix A. Now if you take a wide matrix, if you take a wide matrix and if I say that the rank is one, there's only one row that is a uh, linearly independent. So I get some form like this. The second row gets killed by five times the first row. The rank deficiency is one. What is the column space? You take the first column, the pivot column of A, and say that that is the basis of the column space. But how many elements does it have? It's got two elements, two components. So the column space is a, is a subset of R2. So there's a line of vectors in R2. There's a subset of R2, dimension one. And the basis would be the pivot column of R A. So far in our course, most of the time, we looked at uh, the system of linear equations of and ax equal to b, where b was not necessarily zero. So the right-hand side of the set of equations was not necessarily zero. But, but we did look at uh, some cases where b was actually zero when we were defining uh, the linear independence of a set of vectors, remember? This is in uh, chapter 8, actually. So if you have a bunch of vectors as a columns of a uh, matrix A, AI, and if you can find a particular linear combination, the, the numbers, the scaling factors not zero, not all zero, such that the linear combination is zero, then 
the columns of the matrix are not linearly independent. So this we actually said. So the notion of linear dependence is that you would be able to find some set of uh, numbers x, not, not all zero, such that a linear combination is equal to zero. So that basically, if you look at uh, xi times ai, there's linear combinations of the vectors ai, and if you put the ai's in a, in a matrix, that basically reads ax equal to zero. If you can find a, ax equal to zero without x being a zero vector, then the columns are not linearly independent. Now, the set of all such vectors, non-zero vectors, well, including zero also, but non-zero vectors, would be the solution set. And that set is called the null space. So a null space will always have the zero vector because uh, ax equal to zero when x equal to zero, trivially, all the time. But if you can find some other vectors, non-zero vectors, that also will be a part of the null space. Here is a definition, null space of A, null space of A is a set of all vectors x such that ax equal to zero. It's a solution set of the homogeneous system of linear equations ax equal to zero. Now, one thing to note is that if there are two such vectors in the null space, if you have x1 such that ax1 equal to zero and x2 such that ax2 equal to zero, then any linear combinations of x1 and x2, so that also will be a part of a the null space x1 equal to 0 because x1 is a member of the null space of so is x2 which means a x2 also equal to 0. I can multiply the first one by some scaling factor s1, second one by some scaling factor s2. That wouldn't change the right hand side because it's already 0. I add them up. That will basically give me a times s1 x1 plus s2 x2 equal to 0. That means s1 x1 plus s2 x2 a times that vector equal to 0. So that has to be a member of the null space of a. So what we used here is the fact that uh, the scalar multiplication commutes with the vector, multi uh, vector multiplication or matrix multiplication. In other words, s a is the same as a s. That's what we used in being able to go from here to here. So since the linear combinations are all in the, the null space, it means that null space really is a subspace. If it was not closed under the process of taking a linear combination, then it wouldn't be closed under the process of, uh, under the basic operations of uh, vector spaces, then it would not be closed. We would not be able to call it a subspace. Now, what I'm proving here to you is the fact that the null space really is a subspace. Remember, null space is not a linear combination of uh, anything really, it's actually a solution set. Each vector in the null space is of the kind x, the, the variable vector. So if you have a matrix of size m by n, then remember x is a member of Rn because the number of components in, uh, in x, number of rows of uh, x, is the same as the number of columns of a is n so, so that you can do the multiplication country of multiplication so x has as many as the columns of a so x is a member of r n the null space of a is a span of all such vectors so the null space has to be a subset of r n now if you think about a x equal to zero so what i have is a x equal to zero because x i'm thinking of x in the null space of uh, a now let me write a as a bunch of uh, rows, not as columns let me think of as a row so i have so that's my matrix a and if i'm thinking of a x now x is here and i'm saying that is equal to zero what is zero that is a vector of m elements also zero zero all the way up to m to one m of them so that's the way it is so i can read row by row here so what that means is uh, r1 transpose x so r1 transpose of x is equal to zero the number the second one would be R2 transpose equal to zero and this and so on. You know, in general, what I'll have is something like Ri transpose x to zero. That means x is orthogonal to every single every single uh, row in A. So x is a special vector. If x is a member of the null space, then it is it actually implies that it's actually orthogonal to the rows of A. Now it is orthogonal to all rows, then orthogonal to a linear combination of them or also because I can multiply this guy by S1, this guy by S2, and this guy in general by Si, and then I can sum them up. So I'll get something like uh, I running from uh, 1 to M, I transpose, okay? That is uh, my first entity. That is a linear combination, Si, Ri transpose. That is my linear combination, multiplied by X, and sum up the right-hand side, which is just zero. So 
x is orthogonal to all linear combinations of uh, of the rows of a or linear or possible linear combinations so my si here can be any number that would be the span of the rows of uh, a that would be orthogonal to my x vector if x is a member of uh, the null space of a now the span of the rows of a uh, all possible the set of all possible linear combinations of a i'm going to call that the, the row space that's going to call that the row space of a that is perpendicular to the null space. so that's what i'm trying to say here ri transpose times x is actually zero and then all linear combinations will also give me zero now instead of calling it the rows of a i don't really like it because remember vectors are always columns which is why i wrote the ri transpose so i can take a column of a row of a and then takes its uh, transpose or i could just transpose the whole matrix a and then look at the columns of uh, the transpose so the rows of a are row matrices or a better way of looking at it is to say that the columns of a transpose the columns of a transpose they are orthogonal to my x so the linear combination of the any possible linear combination of the rows would be orthogonal to my x as long as x is a member of uh, the null space and the set of all such linear combinations is what we will call the row space the span of the rows of a or the span of the columns of a transpose as a subspace that will be orthogonal to the subspace that is the null space because what's the definition of uh, orthogonality of two subspaces if all vectors in one subspace are orthogonal to all vectors in the other subspace then these two subspaces are orthogonal to each other that's what we just learned about the row space and the, and the null space so the row space is the span of the rows of a is a set of all possible linear combinations of the rows of a or it's also the span of the columns of a transpose you will reuse the symbol column space but it's a column space of a transpose which is a row space of a now remember just like the column operations did not change the column space the row operations will not change the row space so if you want to find the basis for the row space you could say take the pivot rows of the, of the matrix the linearly independent rows of the matrix a or you could take the pivot rows of its R, ref or rref because in order to go from a to its ref or to its rref all we are doing are just elementary row operations which do not change the row space the significance row space so again let's take our favorite matrix m rows and columns rank is r and if you think about ax equal to b what is it doing it's taking a vector x and giving you a vector b so the input is x output is b but the input vectors input vectors belong to r n each vector x has n components so they belong to r n the output vectors b they belong to r m same as the number of rows of uh, the matrix a so it's a mapping from r to r m that's one way of looking at it now we already saw that if you have null space that is the collection of all possible solutions of ax equal to zero which means vectors in the null space will go to the zero zero vector if you take an x in the null space, ax is going to be zero so vectors in the null space will go to b equal to zero so vectors in the null space will map to zero and then vectors in the row space will map to something that is not zero which will be a linear combination of the columns of a or such linear combinations will be in the column space so vectors in the row space will go to the column space if you're zero then it would already be in the null space uh, it will go to the non-zero elements of the column space now we already saw that the row space is orthogonal to the null space but it's actually better than that it's actually orthogonal complement they are actually ortho orthogonal complements of each other so we did not prove the complement part remember orthogonal complementarity means orthogonal complement is the collection of all possible orthogonal vectors to the vectors in the subspace so take my word for it for now that the row space is not merely orthogonal it's actually the orthogonal complement of the list and remember the row space being the linear combinations of the rows each of which has uh, n components and null space being the linear combinations of uh, of the solutions each of which has uh, n components too they both belong to rn and the fact that they are orthogonal complements will mean that the dimension of row space plus the dimension of the null space will be equal to the dimension of the containing space which is n the number of rows. now what's the dimension of the row space that is the number of linearly independent rows of the matrix a what's the number of linearly independent rows of the matrix a is a rank of a so this guy is the rank and this guy the dimension of the null space is called the nullity so that is the rank nullity theorem that is saying that the rank of a matrix plus its nullity is the number of uh, columns of the matrix the number of uh, 
linearly independent rows of A is the same as the number of linearly independent columns of A. So rank is also the number of linearly independent columns. So one way of stating the rank nullity theorem is to say that the number of linearly independent columns of A plus the dimension of the null space is equal to N. That I think is the way people usually say it. So rank plus nullity is equal to N. That is the famous rank nullity theorem which is like the cornerstone of algebra, one of the fundamental foundational theorems in linear algebra. Now there is one thing I want to show you before we move on to an example which is this suppose i take a vector that is in the row space and suppose i take another vector that is in the the null space and i add them up so x parallel is in the row space x perpendicular is in the null space and i add and then multiply by a what's going to happen a multiplication will distribute into the summation so that is a x parallel plus a x perpendicular but a x perpendicular x being a member of the null space that is going to go to zero so there is nothing there. Whenever you add a vector from the null space, it doesn't change the, the right side of the equation. This has got some relevance to the fact that you have uh, infinity of solutions, etc. You have infinite number of uh, vectors in the null space. You add any one of them to the vectors in the, the row space and the right hand side doesn't change. So let's actually get an example here. Suppose I take a matrix, it's simplified version because it's a basically identity matrix in which I killed element in the row number three, column number three. What's the rank of this matrix A? It is two because it's got uh, two linearly independent uh, rows and columns, but better than that, it's got two pivots right, right in front of you. They're actually unit pivots. What's the row space of, uh, of this matrix? In order to find the row space, I have to find uh, the linearly independent rows which will be this row and this row. So if I want to say what the, the row space is, I have to know what the containing space is. Each row has got three components okay, and the rank is two. So the basis vectors will be the pivot rows, but so the basis would be the pivot rows, this row and this row. So the first one is going to be one, zero, zero. So that is one, zero, zero, the pivot row, what is the column? And then one is zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. So those are the basis vectors. And the dimension is 2 because my rank is 2. Now, how do you find the null space of uh, this, this particular matrix? Now, in order to find the null space, you have to think about Ax equal to 0. So, I have to multiply by some x here so that I get 0. One such vector would be 0, 0, some value z. So, what happens if I multiply A with that? I get 0 of the first column, 0 of the second column, z of the third column. But the third column is already zero, 0, so that is going to be equal to 0. So any vector of the kind 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 5, all those things will give me Ax equal to 0. In general, I can say that the null space, again, will be vectors of the kind x will have three components, number of elements, number of unknowns, and the dimension is 1. Dimension is 1 because you can find only one solution. The basis for that is 0, 0, z but might as well normalize it and call it 0, 0, 1. Now, this is all fine. The reason I wanted to show you all this thing is we can visualize this. What is the, the basis for the, the row space? It is 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0. If you think about it in a coordinate space, what do you have for 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0? What are the linear combinations of those two guys in a normal x, y, z space? 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 is a vector here. That is my x-axis and 0, 1, 0, that is my y-axis and my row space C of A transpose was uh, had the basis these two vectors. For my row spaces, all of this space, all possible linear combinations of uh, my null space, I said the null space was uh, had the basis 0, 0, 1. I'm writing it properly as a set because the basis is actually a set of vectors and that vector is actually along this axis. So as you can see, the z-axis is orthogonal to x and y plane. All vectors on uh, the z-axis are orthogonal to all vectors on the x-y plane. So take a vector on the x-y, some vector in some direction in the x-y plane, and that is always orthogonal to the z-axis vectors on the z-axis. Similarly, if you take some vector on the z-axis, some scalar multiple of that vector, that's going to be orthogonal to all the vectors on the x-y plane. More than that, if I find any vector that is orthogonal to the z-axis at all, that has to necessarily on the x y plane, cannot be anywhere else. And if I find a vector that is uh, orthogonal to the x y plane, it has to be along the z axis, it cannot be anywhere else. So in linear algebra, all our vectors will start at the, at the origin. So that is, this is my row space here, my row space here, and my 
nerve space and they are orthogonal complements of each other. If I take the union of these two guys, we just O space, union, nerve space. That will be all the vectors on the x-plane plus the vectors on the z-axis. But that is only a tiny part of the space. There are many other vectors in some random direction, not on the z-axis z nor on the x-y-plane. Most of the vectors in the space are actually not on the plane nor on the z-axis. They're all linear combinations of these guys. So if I call a vector on the x-y-plane x parallel and vector along the z-axis x uh, perpendicular, all such vectors will describe all of R3 because if I if you give me any vector in any direction, I can find the right weight of that along uh, along some x parallel and some x perpendicular. So I can des describe that. And what I was saying is that if I multiply this by the matrix A, if I transform this combination by A, what will happen is that this will become A x parallel plus A x perpendicular. But x perpendicular is in the null space, remember. So this guy will go to zero vector and that becomes just A x. So that's what I was trying to say. In other words, take any vector, any non-zero vector in R3, which will be of the kind this and multiply that, transform that using the matrix A. That will be a linear combination of the columns of A, which means this will go to my column space of A. So that's what I was trying to say. So all vectors will go either to the zero vector if, they, if it is in the null space or go to the column space. So that's all I said. So the row space was really orthogonal complement of the null space in that case because I showed it to you. All vectors on the uh, row space x, y plane are orthogonal and there are no other vectors that are orthogonal to the row space that are not in the null space. That is the, the definition of orthogonal complement diet. So I gave you three spaces, column space, null space and the row space. So I owe you one more space. So let's look at uh, what's called the left null space. So column space are the linear combinations of the columns of A, span of the columns of A. Row space would be the span of the, the columns of A transpose or the rows of A. And the null space would be the solution set. Now there is a solution set of A transpose also and that will be the left null space. But if you think about AX equal to B, I showed you that if X is in the null space, now we know by definition that if X is in the null space, that will necessarily go to the zero vector by definition. And if X is not in the null space, as we saw here in my R vector, X is not in the null space, all such vectors will go to the column space because the component that is in the null space will not contribute to anything that will just disappear to zero vector. And then there is nothing left in the input space. In Rn, vectors are either in the null space or not. If it is in the null space, it will go to the zero vector. If it is not in the null space, it will go to the column space. So there's nothing left to go to the left null space. So nothing goes to the left null space. So that is, that completes the picture. So I have our matrix, M rows and columns, rank is R. And we have our equation, AX equal to B, which is a mapping. A, A takes vectors of the type X in Rn because it's got N columns and gives you vectors in Rm. So the input space is in green, Rn. Output, output space is in, in red, in Rm. So we have the uh, span of the columns of uh, A, that is a column space, that is in Rm because each vector in the column of A in a column of A will have M components, M rows, right? And that is a column. This is also called image or range. Why that is the case, we will see in a, in a minute. But you can kind of see why it's an image. It's a reflection of something that is happening on the, on the left-hand side. X is the input, that is the object, and uh, B, the output, that is the image. And range comes from the corresponding nomenclature in the world of functions. Now, that was the first space. Remember, it's a subspace, so it's called zero. So this little uh, circle here, that actually refers to the zero vector. Now I had the null space. By definition, null space was a collection of all the vectors that will give me AX equal to zero. So all the vectors in the null space will go to the zero vector on the output side. And the zero vector will, of course, naturally go to zero. And zero is part of all spaces. So zero is a part of null space as well. Then I had my row space. All the vectors in the row space will go to the column space because AX equal to B, if you take a vector in, in the row space, is the linear combination of uh, columns of A. If it was zero, the vector would be in the null space. If it's not, then that would go to the column space, non-zero element in the columns. But as we saw from our example, row space was the XY plane and uh, null space was the Z axis. A large number of vectors, in fact, most of the vectors in the in the three-dimensional space were not in the row space nor in the null space. They were linear combinations. 
those vectors are linear combinations of vectors from the row space and the null space they all go to the column space as well so we've accounted for everything that is happening in r and there's nothing that is left to go to the left null space now the row space is also called Im co image because column space is the image and null space is called the kernel the left null space is called the left kernel now let's think about the containing space the containing space rn on the input side that is called the domain that is where you draw the the x vectors from that is like the the, ve the space where the input vectors live similarly the output vectors they live in the the co domain that is rm so that is the com the picture so the arrows are all from uh, left to right but it's a nice symmetric picture and it acts much better later on in the very chapter the very last picture that i'll leave you with is based on this but it will become symmetric with arrows going from right back to left also and that symmetry that elegance and that beauty of linear algebra is what i want to leave you with and i'm hoping that that will inspire you to learn more about linear algebra and more about mathematics and uh, maybe do extremely well in computer science now why we have other names so in order to understand that let's look at a normal function from r to r x is in r and the function value is in r as well and i have the function right there it's absolute value the positive value of the square root of x if i have that and i can compare a x equal to b where this mapping is actually from r and to r m the first mapping function is from R to R, but A is from R and R and to R M. Input in R and output in R M. The domain is the space where the argument x lives, and that is uh, just a real number, x number of R. Similarly, the domain is the space where the x vector lives, that is in R N. Codomain is a space of uh, uh, the output value f x, that is R also in the in this functional example but in our linear algebra example output is in rm range is all possible output values and that's also called the image in this particular example you cannot get negative values you can get only zero or positive values so that is the the range of the image Similarly, in our case you can get only the column space then nothing else no other vector in the rm is accessible by this transformation there may be other vectors but not accessible co-image is all possible values of the input in this case you cannot take a negative value of x because you cannot take the square root so similarly in the case of uh, a x equal to b row space is considered the the co-image kernel if i stretch my analogy a little bit i can probably define as those values of x that will give me a zero output value so x equal to zero is a kernel but in the case of a system of linear equations it's got a more concrete meaning is the solution to homogeneous uh, set of equations that is the null space everything that will give me b equal to zero co-kernel is uh, the value that cannot be reached in the case of uh, fx you cannot get output value negative because it's already an absolute value similarly left null space cannot be reached there is no b that belongs to the left null space. so that's what where the names are coming from even though i wanted to tell you where the names are coming from and what the names are we will be using only column space row space null space etc because all these other names confuse me to be with and but you may need to know it not from the exam perspective necessarily but if you look up something uh, on the internet or something there are people who use uh, those names rather than the the names of the spaces like columns row space etc now quickly go over the definitions and uh, stuff as a review column space in the linear combination of the columns of a span of uh, the columns of a is a subspace subspace of dimension r where r is the rank rank is r m rows and n columns and the column space lives in r m because each vector has got m components each column of a has got m components so it lives in uh, r m that's the containing space in order to find the basis for it you find the pivot column in ref but don't take it from the ref go back to the original matrix and those columns will be a basis of course it being a subspace it contains the zero vector if b is in the column space we can always find solutions to the system of linear equations ax equal to b because we are looking for that particular linear combination and if we know that b is already a linear combination we will define it either one or many such solutions what i'm trying to say is the column space is a subspace of dimension r 
in Rm, where R is a rank and M is the number of rows of the matrix A. Null space is a set of solutions to A x equal to 0. It is the solution set. It lives in Rn because these are vectors that can be x. And the dimensionality is called the nullity or the right nullity. And that is the number of free variables. That would be the number of uh, columns minus the number of uh, linearly independent columns, the rank. So that will be the number of free variables, the, the columns that don't have uh, pivots. And the basis is a bit hard to find because you have to actually find the, the solutions, what we call the special solutions. We'll see an example very soon. But the containing space is Rn because each vector x has n components. And so summarizing, null space is a subspace of Rn with dimension n minus r, n minus r. Now row space of same matrix is a set of linear combinations of the rows of A or the columns of uh, A transpose. And that also has dimension r because the number of linearly independent rows of A would be the pivot rows, which will have uh, the number as the pivots, and that is the rank. So in order to find the the basis for uh, the row space, you'll have to find the linearly independent rows of the matrix, which would be the pivot rows, e either of the matrix or its uh, row reduced forms. Because row reduction, elementary row operations do not change the row space. But the containing space is the same as the null space, it's on the input side, Rn. Each row has n elements. So the rows, the subspace of dimension R, rank in Rn, n being the number of columns. Left null space is the solution set of A transpose y equal to zero. It's, it lives on the output side and it's got the dimension of number of rows minus the rank. So this one is not that important, but just to let you know, the left null space is a subspace of Rm on the output side of dimension m minus R. Now we already saw the connection between null space and uh, row space. They are orthogonal complements of each other. They are both subspaces of uh, the same input space, the domain, they have to be, otherwise they cannot be orthogonal complements. So the, given the fact that uh, they are orthogonal complements, that will imply that uh, the rank of the matrix, which is the, the dimension of the row space, plus the nullity, which is the dimension of the null space, will be the same as the dimension of the containing space, Rn, so n. So rank plus, plus nullity is uh, n, which is the rank nullity theorem. And we saw that uh, all vectors in the row space are orthogonal to all vectors in the null space. The complement part, which we did not prove, it is there in the textbook. You might want to take a look at it if you're interested. But, but what it says is this. It says that if I have a vector that is in the null space, I have a vector that is in the null space, and I find a vector that is orthogonal to it, some vector that is orthogonal to it, then that vector that I find necessarily have to be in the row space. It cannot be anywhere else. That is what the identity means. It's like the completeness. Similarly, if I have a vector that is in a row space and I find something that is orthogonal to it, that will mean that what I find will have to be there in the null space. It cannot be anywhere else. Again, remember that table that I gave you, x, y plane and the z axis, those are really orthogonal complements. So if I take the basis for, uh, for uh, the row space and the null space, together they will form the basis for the input space because they are orthogonal complements. The dimensionalities will add up, add up properly. They will kind of cover uh, everything, which is like the x, y plane, my row space, and the z axis. So if I have x along the x and along the y directions and the z axis, then there is a good basis. Uh, we also know that all the vectors in uh, the null space will go to zero. The ones that are not in the null space will have to go to some non-zero value, and those are basically in the column space. And we show, show you this also. If I add a vector from the null space to a vector in the row space, it doesn't change the right hand side because a times uh, any vector in the null space will become zero. But remember, most of uh, the input space is neither in the row space nor in the null space in uh, the most general case. Our example, x, y plane and z axis, most of the vectors are neither on the x, y plane nor along the z axis. They were somewhere else. It is important to realize that the union of the row space and the null space would be just a part of the input space. But it's the linear, it's the span of all those vectors that will actually cover the input space. Now let's go through a bunch of examples, bunch of examples, kind of quickly because we've done this already. I have a matrix here, all prime numbers, three by three matrix. What's its rank? It is three. What is its column space? It's all of R3. Does A is equal to B have solutions? How many solutions? It's unique because this is invertible. So the solution is just the inverse of this matrix times whatever B you have. 
and that will always give you this one solution. What's its uh, row space? It's again R3. What's a good basis for the row space and the column space? The identity matrix. So remember, all invertible matrices will have the same row space and column space. So invertible will imply that it is a square matrix. It will also imply that it's full rank. That means they will have they will have all of the input space and the output space, which are the same spaces, and they will all flow reduced to the identity matrix by Gauss Jordan. And the fancy way of saying that is that they are row and column equivalent to each other. Row equivalent means you can get from one to the other using row elementary row operations, and column equivalent means you can do the same using elementary column operations. So let's go from the example to a generalization. A full rank square matrix will row reduce to an identity matrix and that would be a good basis for the column space and row space. So the row, the column space is Rn, row space is Rn, null spaces are not empty but uh, set with just a zero vector. This is actually troublesome philosophically because I don't know whether to call this empty or not but I prefer not empty. So if I have a question in, in a quiz or the final exam asking you is the null space empty? Do not say it is empty. In my book it is not empty because it's got a zero vector in it. All right, if it is rank deficient, then the row reduction will give you n minus r rows in uh, zero rows in the bottom and some free variables, n minus r of them, and that, that will be mingled in with uh, an identity matrix. So the column space will be a subset of Rn with dimension same as rank. The row space also a subset of Rn same dimension. Nullity is a dimension of uh, the null space n minus r. The left nullity, the dimension of the left null space is also n minus r. Now let's take another example, a full column rank matrix. So it's the same as the previous guy that I added one more row here. And if you do the RREF, you will get the identity matrix in the top and zero row, uh, zero row in the bottom. What's the, the rank of this guy? Three, because three linearly dependent columns what is the the column space of this guy remember when in, uh, when i'm asking for columns i'm asking for the containing space dimension and the basis vectors the containing spaces are four yes but what about the dimension dimension three and the basis vectors will be the three columns of a not of rrf three columns does ax equal to b have solutions now it becomes a bit more complicated does it have solutions depends on consistency because you have a zero row so it is possible that this can be equal to some number some number b not zero in which case it won't have solution but what if happens to be zero then how many solutions will it have unique so either unique or no solution so that's the situation here what's the row space of this guy it's r3 is it all of r3 or or a subset a subspace in r3 is a subspace of r3 with dimension 3 which means it's all of r3 okay it's all of r3 so all full rank full column rank matrices will row reduce to something like an identity matrix in, on top with some zero rows in the bottom it may have solutions if b is in uh, in the column space of uh, the matrix which means the last one will be equal to zero it is not then zero solution if it is a uh, if B is in the column space, then one solution, unique solution. Never an infinity of solutions. The row space is all of R3. So all full rank matrices will, full column rank matrices will row reduce to that. Okay. Now the same thing again using symbols rather than our numbers. So we saw all those things, but let me just say that uh, the column space is got M. Each column has got M elements. So it's in RM. Dimension is N because it's full column rank. The rank is uh, the number of uh, columns, which is n, and the row space is all of Rn. Null space has got only the zero vector in it. The left null space, on the other hand, has got m minus n vectors in it. If it is rank deficient, similar kind of situation, except that I don't have uh, dimension n, but dimension r, which is the rank of the matrix. So similar kind of story. Couple of more examples. Uh, full row rank. So I have three rows here and four columns here. And my RREF is going to be that. So what's the, the rank of this matrix? It's again three because three rows and those are uh, linearly independent. But you can see the pivots right here. That is three also. That is a rank. What's its a column space? All of R3. Each vector is in R3. And I already have the full basis here and then something extra. So it is uh, all of R3. Does AX equal to B have solutions? Is there a possibility that this matrix might lead to inconsistent equations no because there is no zero row 
so you cannot have inconsistency and there is a free variable here corresponding to this column to this column so infinity of solutions always infinity never unique the row space will be what's the row space it's going to be a subset of r4 with dimension equal to the rank which is 3 the rank is a 3 the row reduction as you can see is identity matrix possibly mixed in with uh, free variables it doesn't necessarily have to be cleanly separated always so once more so the row space uh, the, sorry the column space if it is a wide and full rank the column space is all of r m m is the output space and uh, the row space will have the same dimension m but it's a, because n is larger than n it's a subset and the null space will have quality which is n minus m m is a rank if it is rank deficient then the situation is same as before the dimension of a column space and row space will be the rank nullity will be the number of cos minus the rank and the left nullity number of rows minus the rank so a general case i will just write that once more dimension of uh, row spaces r dimension of column spaces r and nullity is n minus r number of columns number of variables minus r the number of free variables nullity is the number of free, free variables and the left nullity is the the number of rows without pivots that is m minus r now computing the four spaces that is an important topic if i have if i have a three by four matrix what i would do to compute the column space would be to do the the row reduction gaussian elimination so that i can find the pivots i get the pivots then i go back to the original matrix and take the pivot columns the first one and the third one that will give me the basis columns and number of pivots will give me the dimension and the number of elements here will give me the containing space so column space will live in a because each uh, each column has three elements so it's a subset of r3 and the rank will be the number of pivots. i have two here so the rank is uh, two that will be the dimension of the the column space so this is, will be the kind of answer i'll give column space this is a subset of r3 dimension is a uh, two then i'll specify the basis which will be the first one and the, the third one one two one and one one zero that will be the basis the pivot columns in the original data the row space the same idea i would do the row reduction maybe ref maybe rref it doesn't really matter i will see the pivots here and here. so two pivots and my row space will have four components in each vector so that lives in uh, r4 that's a containing space and there are two linearly independent rows because those are the pivot rows either in uh, the original matrix or in its uh, row reduced uh, forms it doesn't matter so let's let me take it in from the rref this time so the first row is one one zero three but when i give a basis i would like to see column vectors so that is the one one zero three that will be a basis basis vector the other one will be zero zero one three zero zero one three. so two basis vectors dimension two is the same as the rank living in r4 computing the null space is much more interesting i'll give you one example here now i'm going to call i started from a matrix a i did row reduction gaussian elimination finally i got rref i'm going to call that r now if i have ax equal to zero that is a, that is the equation i have for null space or r equal to zero are the solutions going to be the same in going from a to rref all i did were elementary row operations they were like equation manipulation algebraic manipulations of the equations without changing the solution so ax equal to zero and rx equal to zero will have the same solution set so the null space of a and null space of r will be the same so it's probably easier to work with this so let's start working with that first of all null space also lives in r4 because it's a solution to a solution with uh, four columns, four unknowns so it's a, a vector of size four rank will be the number of uh, rank of a is number of pivots the dimension of the null null space will be the nullity which is four minus two which will be the number of free variables so i have pivot here pivot here so those variables i can solve but this is a free variable because there's no pivot there this is a free variable no pivot there so i have to find the the solutions the free variable the complete solution so i'll solve rx equal to zero so let me actually go ahead and solve this so i have r equal to that rx equal to zero this is free x2 is free x4 is free because no pivot so i just look at the second row the third row doesn't give me anything so look at the second row that reads zero x1 zero x2 one x3 plus three x4 is equal to zero x3 plus three x4 equal to zero that implies if i just 
solve for x3, I get 3x4. Remember, x4 is free variable, so I'm keeping x4 as a take any value for x4. So I solve for the non-free variables in terms of the free variables. If I take the first row, I have x1 plus x2 plus 3x4 equal to 0. So x1 in terms of the free variables is minus x2 minus 3x4. So I can write the solution. I have x1 right here and I have x2 as x2 because it's a free variable and x3 right here and x4 as x4. And that I can decompose into the free variables which can take any value as a linear combination of uh, two vectors here. Maybe I can call it t1, t2 because they can take any value, okay? So it's a linear combination of a couple of uh, vectors. And th those vectors are actually the basis for the null space because any such linear combination when multiplied by A will give me the zero value. So all the linear combinations will belong to space. Now I can actually specify the null space. Null space is a subspace of R4 because four variables. Dimension is two because the number of free variables. And the basis would be the complete solution that I just found here. Minus one, one, zero, zero, minus three, zero, minus three, one. So it's a bit more tedious and more involved to find the null space. And you have to review this process of finding the complete solution, they're very important. And that is actually the process of finding the null space also. So I promised you four spaces, I gave you four spaces, and now you should be able to describe the spaces, fundamental spaces of a, of a matrix. The column space is a span of the columns and the significance is that the constants vector b vector is in the column space the system of linear equations is solvable row space is a linear combination or span of the rows of a or the columns of a transpose and the significance is that if you have a vector in the row space that always goes to a single vector in the in the uh, column space a one-to-one -one mapping from the row space to the column space null space is a solution set of the homogeneous equations ax equal to zero if a vector is in the null space then it always goes to the zero vector left null space basically nothing goes there now we also looked at different shapes and things and looked at the corresponding uh, spaces and the, the properties and we saw how to compute the spaces basically you have to do the gaussian elimination so that you get the pivots and then pick out the right columns the column space, the basis would be the pivot columns of A. For the row space, the basis would be the pivot rows of A or its a row reduced forms. Null space, you have to do the complete solution. Basically, find the special solution for the free variables and uh, that will give you the basis for the null space. The left null space is the same thing, but you have to transpose it first. And the, the ranks and shapes and the connection between those and this spaces we did that now rank is the number of uh, linearly independent columns or number of linearly independent rows and that is also the dimensionality of the column space or the row space that is another definition of the rank nullity is the number of variables it's the, it's the number of columns of the matrix minus the rank of the matrix number of linearly independent columns and the rank nullity theorem basically says rank plus nullity is the number of columns of the matrix